Dr. Wheelock will present first. She will provide perspectives on the clinical care of patients with Huntington's and tell you about the course of this disease as it inexorably worsens over time. Dr. Wheelock is clinical professor of neurology at UC Davis and is an expert on movement disorders. She directs the UC Davis Huntington's Disease Clinic. She started the clinic more than 10 years ago, and this is really a unique partnership with local families, foundations, and importantly, the Northern California chapter of the Huntington's Disease Society of America. Dr. Wheelock's clinic is a designated center of excellence, and this de designation recognizes the work of a multidisciplinary healthcare team who provide testing, diagnosis, and management of Huntington's. Dr. Wheelock and her team conduct numerous clinical trials involving Huntington's, and she is a member of the International Huntington Study Group. But more importantly, ask the patients that Dr. Wheelock cares for. They will tell you that her dedication to her patients and their families as they deal with Huntington's is truly inspiring. I'm pleased to turn the podium over to Dr. Vicki Wheelock. Thank you very much. That was a lovely introduction. So I have the privilege of talking with you in the next few minutes about Huntington's disease from a clinical perspective. And um, to show you where we are, where we need to be, and why the work of CIRM gives us hope, real hope for making a difference. So Huntington's disease is a relatively rare disease, and I want to show you in the, next, in the next few minutes why we're focusing so much on this one area and why the patients and families that we see inspire us to do more. Huntington's disease is responsible, was responsible for the death of Woody Guthrie. Um, he didn't know that he had Huntington's disease in his family when he became ill and started having involuntary movements and psychiatric symptoms, but he's the best known person who was afflicted by it. It's a slowly progressive degeneration of the brain that's inherited, and the genetics uh, tell us that every person who is um, a member of a family of a parent with Huntington's disease has a 50% chance of inheriting this disease. There's about 30,000 people in the United States who have HD and about 150,000 people at risk of getting Huntington's disease. And about 2,000 people per year are newly diagnosed. Uh, Huntington's occurs in all populations throughout the world and unfortunately it leads to death after about a course of about 15 to 20 years. As I've already mentioned, it's a hereditary disease. The way that people get Huntington's is by um, having a family member, a parent who has a form of the Huntington's gene that has a mutation that we'll talk about. One of the hardest things about HD is that it strikes earlier than a lot of degenerative diseases. For instance, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's tend to hit people later in life, but Huntington shows up in people's 20s and 30s and 40s, right when they're at the peak of their adult lives, they're working, having families, and it's a very unwelcome guest into the family. Huntington's disease was named after a physician, uh, Dr. George Huntington, who wrote a very small uh, two and a half page report about the disease based on his observations growing up in Long Island. He was the son and grandson of two physicians and there were members of the community who had involuntary movements and had this disease and he described it very cogently. Um, so that's why it's named after George Huntington. Um, Woody Guthrie died in 1967 and his widow Marjorie at her kitchen table formed a community advocacy group that became the Huntington's Disease Society of America. That's a very vigorous organization right now. And a year later, Dr. Milton Wexler in Los Angeles formed the Hereditary Disease Foundation because of his wife's uh, affliction and her family members' affliction with Huntington's disease. And that foundation was uh, charged with bringing together scientists, both the very senior experienced people, but importantly the young new scientists, and uh, drawing them together to work together to try to understand the genetics and to find a cure. 
Um, in 1972, there was a centennial of Huntington's disease, and a group of researchers from Venezuela came up to the United States and showed movies of people in these small fishing villages along the large freshwater lake, Lake Maracaibo, um, who had Huntington's disease. And as a result, scientists got together, including Dr. Nancy Wexler, who's a neuropsychologist at Columbia University. Her father started the Hereditary Disease Foundation. They took his team of scientists down to Venezuela to meet the families, do pedigrees, collect blood specimens, and in 1983 they were able to localize the um, mutation to chromosome number four. It took them 10 years in that old technology to find the exact gene, but in 1993 they found the exact gene and we learned exactly what the mutation is that causes Huntington. So there's one specific target. If there's an expansion in this gene of the CAG repeat, people will get Huntington's and they will die of Huntington's. And if they don't have the expansion, they won't. So that's sort of the inspiration to all of us. It's just in this one place, if we could only do something about this one gene, we would have a cure. So the gene, as I've mentioned, has an expansion of the DNA messages for CAG that results in the formation of a protein, the Huntington protein, which is present in every cell of the body, but for reasons we still don't entirely understand, only causes the brain cells to degenerate. And it's not every brain cell, it's selected specific brain cells that degenerate and result in the symptoms. Um, we can track those brain changes by looking at brain scans like MRI scans. We can look under the microscope. We can do very high technology uh, types of scans that show the loss of brain cells and the progressive uh, destruction of brain centers that are involved with the fundamental parts of our being, with how we think, how we move, how we behave. So the set of symptoms that we typically see in HD, the most obvious symptom is a series of movement problems, involuntary dance-like chorea form movements, but also difficulty with generating voluntary movements, trouble swallowing, trouble walking. On top of that, we also have a number of behavior changes and psychiatric changes. People with HD can become irritable, impulsive, apathetic, they can have psychiatric problems like depression or obsessive compulsive disorder. So there are many, many protein findings that come with this disease that, that create this big challenge for people. So we do have genetic testing for Huntington's disease. Uh, this started back in 1993-94, right after the gene was found. And at this point, we make the diagnosis of Huntington's based on people's symptoms. But we have the, the knowledge now that oftentimes, well before diagnosis, there are subtle changes that are happening with thinking and with behavior. And people uh, since 1993 who are at risk for getting Huntington's disease, inheriting it, can choose to be tested to see if they have inherited the mutated gene or not and to learn the future for them. If you have the gene, you will get Huntington's disease. And this leads us to a number of ethical issues for people who are considering testing and real concerns about genetic discrimination for employment, insurance, um, education, all sorts of other things. It's an area that we've been grappling with for, for a long time. Um, Dr. Nancy Wexler has a sister, Alice Wexler, who is a, an English professor and a writer, a, an amazing writer. She wrote a book a number of years ago called Mapping Fate, which shows the story of the scientist who found the gene. And recently, she published a book called The Woman Who Walked Into the Sea. That's a historical account looking at the families in Long Island who were afflicted by Huntington's and trying to understand why people who were integrated into their community so well began to feel shame about this disease in succeeding generations and exploring the eugenics movement. And it's the sort of the source for shame and secrecy that has uh, persisted about this disease in some families. The treatments for Huntington's disease are palliative. We can do a number of things to help uh, ameliorate the symptoms, but we don't have any effective treatments for delaying the onset or slowing the progression. We do have one drug. The first drug was approved for Huntington's in the United States just last year in 2008, um, tetrabenazine, and that helps out with the movement problems, but it doesn't help out with the other features of the disease. So we have formed multidisciplinary teams that help patients and families and people at risk to learn about the disease and help manage their symptoms. And in partnership with 
um, Judy Robertson, who was the inspiration for this work, and the community and, and healthcare providers who were called to help people with this disease. We've established wonderful teams uh, throughout the country that help people manage the symptoms. And there are 21 centers of excellence for care. Um, there are three here in California. Um, ours at UC Davis, one at UCLA, and one at UC San Diego. This is the Huntington Study Group. This is a consortium of researchers who came together in the 1990s looking to try to perform clinical research that would lead to meaningful treatments and, of course, to lead to a cure. And it's an international consortium that we're part of. And this consortium leads a number of clinical trials of different drugs and compounds that we hope will help delay the onset or keep people in the earlier uh, symptoms for longer and help treat the symptoms. Um, so we have a number of people in our clinic who are participating in research. So um, families, amazing families aff afflicted by Huntington's disease volunteer to come in and give their blood and have brain scans and do thinking tests and take experimental drugs in the hope that we'll make a difference and we'll find a cure. And they're doing it for themselves and they're doing it for their children and their grandchildren very powerfully. So there's an, uh, more and more clinical uh, support for clinical research in Huntington's disease. The NIH is increasingly funding research into different compounds. Private foundations have been extremely important. And pharmaceutical companies are now coming to the, to the fore uh, more and more to help out. Right now, we have over 4,000 people in the US enrolled in observational trials about Huntington's. Think of that number. There's only 30,000 people, and we've got a large percentage of them who are enrolled in these clinical trials. We have about 1,700 people taking experimental drugs right now. And um, the progress so far is we have one drug for movement. We know that we can see the patients, help the patients, recruit them into studies, maintain their confidentiality, maintain their trust. We have tools for measuring Huntington's disease. We know the progression. We know the symptoms. We know that the symptoms are uh, starting well before diagnosis. So we're ready. We're ready for a cure now. And despite all the years of efforts, we're not very close yet with traditional research. We need stem cell ther therapies. So our new hope for Huntington's disease is that the stem cell therapies that are being developed, and especially by Dr. Nolta in her lab, will help to downregulate this gene, to downregulate the protein, to deliver growth factors to help the nerve cells, and even to grow new neurons. And we are so grateful to CIRM for their support to help us to make the next leap into making a meaningful difference. Thank you very much. As you've probably been able to tell, Dr. Wheelock is really the epitome of the compassionate clinician. And I think she becomes really, in a way, a member of every Huntington's family. I know how much she means to them and they mean to her.